One last introduction to our Lewis structures what would be with ionic compounds and Lewis dots. For an ionic compound, you get a little bit different of an approach. So I wanted to draw out a metal and a non-metal for us so that we can see the differences here. Now I'm just going to pop that electron over, one electron being transferred. That makes lithium plus one. And chlorine with eight electrons around it and a minus one. Lithium chloride, there's the formula unit. I could see that one to one ratio, one electron, one electron. We'll call that extra or valence for the lithium. And we'll call that needed or empty for the chlorine. Now it doesn't always have to be a one-to-one -one ratio. Sodium and sulfur can react. But see what happens here is sodium can donate one electron, but we still have this empty space for sodium, another sodium to fill up right here for sulfur. So there are effectively two sodium plus one cations for every one sulfur anion. So the formula unit Na2S. Notice that that subscript identifies two sodiums for every one sulfur. We can understand that one right there. Now, speaking of ionic compounds, what we want to be able to look at is a little bit more than what Lewis has to offer. Namely, what we want to be able to focus on is a crystal lattice. That lattice is important for us because what we actually end up seeing is that an ionic bond is not just a transfer of energy. If we think about sodium and chlorine coming together, what needs to happen for sodium and chlorine to come together is this. Sodium solid and one chlorine, notice there's that diatomic, we'll just take half of it to make NaCl. What scientists thought way back in the day was that all it took was that transfer of electrons. So sodium becomes sodium plus one and we lose that electron. Chlorine gains that one electron to become chlorine minus one. But that's not the only thing that happens. Lattice also happens. It's the buildup of the actual ions. This idea that tells us the overall energy change for making an ionic compound. Now let's just break this down a little bit and revisit Coulomb's law. If I know sodium will become sodium plus one and release one electron, that is called ionization energy. And I can look that value up on a table. It costs 496 kilojoules per mole to remove an electron from sodium. Yes, it's favorable, but it still costs money to pull that, or costs energy, to pull that electron away from the nucleus because opposites attract. For chlorine to gain that one electron and become chlorine minus one, that is electron affinity. 
that releases 349 kilojoules per mole. So overall, if I were just to add those two together, I would see that to make sodium chloride, it would be overall positive in energy, meaning that it costs us. That is an endothermic reaction. But what we actually see is that it, that's not the case at all. When we go in the lab and investigate this reaction, we can measure the amount of energy change total. That's what we call the overall delta E. The overall change, we'll use delta H because this is heat energy only. The overall delta H energy change is a negative value and it's a huge negative value. What the heck, why is this? This is what was puzzling. Doesn't match up. So scientists were really concerned. What is the overall ionic bond? That's the driving force to make the ionic bond because it's not the transfer of electrons. Yes, the transfer of electrons is beneficial because we have achieved noble gas configuration, but that doesn't tell us why the compound actually stays stuck together so well. What we actually have to consider is the lattice energy, the lattice energy step. When sodium plus one and chlorine minus one actually come together in the buildup, that delta H is a huge value. And that is the overall driving force for this reaction to take place. We consider, yes, that we need the idea of the electrons actually being transferred, but in reality, that lattice energy step is very, very important. It's the overall driving force to get the reaction to take place. So, a couple of things with lattice energy. Lattice energy is going to be defined as the energy released during the formation of a crystalline lattice. That means it's overall exothermic. Now, some textbooks um, will write lattice energy as a positive value um, because they are understood to be big and they're understood to be negative. And I see merit in making it a positive value so that we can say a larger lattice energy and not think a larger negative number. I'll keep it as a negative number and just make sure that we identify. Now, why we need to revisit Coulomb's law is the idea of being able to conceptualize the lattice energy overall. Now, when we look at these Qs, these are charges. These are going to be our ions, our anion and our cation. R is the radius or the distance between the two ions. So what this says is that opposites attract a plus one and a minus one over a specific distance will always give us a negative energy. A negative multiplied by a positive is going to be negative. And as they get closer and closer together, as that denominator decreases, then the energy gets even larger negative. So the lattice is favorable because of Coulomb's law. Opposites attracting and getting closer and closer and closer together releases energy. Negative 
exothermic. What does that mean for something like NaCl versus MgO? We already talked about these two and compared just their charges earlier. Which one would have a bigger lattice energy? Well, think about Coulomb's law. If lattice energy is directly related to those ions coming together, whichever ions would produce a larger value here, Q1 times Q2, that will be the largest energy. That one over four pi epsilon is a constant. So in Coulomb's law, what we really want to focus on is opposites attracting here. The larger the charges, so plus twos, minus twos, plus threes, minus threes, the larger the charges, the larger the lattice energy. Specifically, if we think about plus one multiplied by minus one, that's a minus one. If we think about plus two multiplied by minus two, that's a minus four. Magnesium oxide will have four times as large of a lattice energy than sodium chloride. Okay, as we are continuing on, um, what I want to go over next, I will wrap up with conductivity and then we'll end with naming of ionic compounds. Now this is what um, Lewis was talking about. If we just stick um, two probes into solid ionic compounds, yes, there was an energy exchange, but they are locked in a lattice structure. And so those two solids, uh, those two ions being solid, um, don't allow the electrical conductivity that we see when they are actually in aqueous mixtures. That aqueous idea means dissolved in water. What that does, water is allowed to break up the lattice structure and what we see are free floating ions. And that breakup of the lattice structure is something very important that we'll discuss in a later unit, but it was predicted in Lewis structures. Ionic compounds, when they are solid, are locked in the lattice structure. When those ionic compounds are allowed to dissolve in water, the ions are allowed to break up and commingle with the water molecules, and therefore they can conduct electricity.